Okay. Welcome everyone. I think we have a quorum here. My name is Flint and I am uh, delighted to introduce Dr. Pei Chen, who will be giving grand rounds this afternoon. Dr. Chen is an award-winning clinician educator and associate professor in our division and a primary care physician at the San Francisco VA. She's the program director for the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship. She's a medical school coach. She is um, the winner of multiple education awards, including most recently Outstanding Junior Clinician Educator of the Year at the American Geriatric Society meeting in 2021. Um, and going back a little bit, Dr. Chen attended medical school at University of Vermont and went on to internal medicine residency at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, and then to Mount Sinai for geriatrics fellowship, where she was selected to be a chief fellow in her second year. And I will just add on a personal note, I work very closely with Dr. Chen on our fellowships and her love of teaching and mentoring and geriatrics in general is truly inspiring. And she told me she loves having longitudinal relationships with learners because she can see them develop professionally. And I imagine that that is also something that she loves about geriatrics. And today, um, Dr. Chen will be talking to us about her journey to becoming a geriatrician. And we welcome people to put their questions in the chat as we go along. And I think I will pass it off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, uh, for that kind introduction um, and inviting me to this grand round. Uh, let me just share my screen. Hopefully I'll do this right. Um, oop. Ah, hold on a sec. Let me just do that again. Sorry about that. Technical difficulty here. Okay, um, I hope you can see the slides. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, becoming a geriatrician and I will use a case to help us get there. Um, first, I have nothing to disclose and um, it's going to be based on a very personal story today and my own reflection um, on becoming a geriatrician. By the end, um, uh, you will hear and get to learn about how to describe a uncommon disease with a common geriatric syndromes. And we will review current state of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship training with some emphasis on interprofessional collaboration and education. And finally, um, some reflection on how we um, draw on our own experiences and develop strategies for well being. Um, this is something that is just incredibly important at this time um, and also in our profession as we. Uh, most likely will experience changes in our life, loss and grief um, in, our, in our personal lives and also um, as we take care of our patients. So, well, um, this is how it starts. We haven't seen a case like this in 50 years. Um, that was a voice um, on the other end. There was some hesitation and excitement and uh, he didn't really stop um, much um, with a pause before he continued. It looks like CJD. Um, that was how the news was delivered um, to the daughter, the healthcare agent, or me over the phone. Um, this was done by a neuroradiologist on the other end, and there was a psychiatrist a neurologist, an infectious disease doctor, and my father in Taiwan, where my parents live. Um, I tried to take a deep breath between the sentences to prepare myself, but nothing really could prepare me for this. Um, it was not, there was no time to really take a, for, for that breath to finish before he said it. Um, and the directness of this bad news delivery just landed and I was actually standing in a dark foyer. Um, I was actually visiting my aunt-in-law um, during my vacation. Um, so I, 
I knew what CJD is, and I actually, unfortunately, in some ways, saw it once in my fellowship, and uh, it was just, it was just really bad uh, for the patient that I saw, and this certainly was a very bad news for me. Um, so CJD stands. Oops, sorry. Ah, I should not use my mouse. Um, CJD stands for Crucifel Jacobs disease. Um, is a rapid progressive fatal neurodegenerative disease. Um, it came about because of this man called Alphon Jacob, um, who actually described the first case of human prion disease in the early 1920s. And he thought it was actually very similar to another case of a young woman described by Hans Jacob, um, also in the 1920s. It turned out that two of his five cases were actually prion disease and the rest were not. Um, so in UCSF, we have a great neurologist, Dr. Um, Stanley Prusiner, um, who actually received a Nobel Prize in 1997 um, by isolating the scrapie agent. Um, that was previously described uh, to be this, um, this thing, the substance that's transmissible and has a very long incubation period. Um, he confirmed that the scrapie agent was in fact a misfolded transmissible proteinaceous infectious particle. They call it prion. I drew a uh, schematic with my uh, rudimentary understanding. Um, so just to kind of go over it, oh, ah. the, um, the scrapies um, prion protein uh, can come into contact with a normal cellular prion protein leading to misfolding of the normal cellular form. And then subsequently, these two abnormal ones will um, come into contact with other normal cellular prion protein and cause more um, diseased protein um, to occur, leading to ultimately lots of um, neurotoxicity. And the, and the result you can see is really exponential transformation. Um, it's pretty awful. This is fairly uncommon. Um, the incidence is about one to one and a half cases per million per year. There are three groups of CJD, um, the most common one being the sporadic type, accounting for 80 to 95%. Um, and the cause really is still unknown. Um, with the genetic form, that accounts for about 10 to 15%. And there's familial CJD. You may have heard of, uh, about the fatal familial insomnia, among others. And um, the, the least common one is actually the acquired one, less than 1%. Um, but this actually, you may have heard also, um, uh, Kuru or iatrogenic CJD or the variant CJD, um, as in those who had uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And this one is um, when the misfolded protein gets transmitted to a person um, from an outside source, causing the person's endogenous normal prime protein to misfold. The mean age of onset for that one is usually in the mid 20s and it has longer clinical manifestation usually with a mean duration or median duration of 14 months. Um, worldwide, um, the UK actually tracks um, the, the death uh, from the def definitive or probable CJD and there's actually a steady increase, uh, especially in the sporadic form, they think it's maybe related to um, improved clinician awareness, um, general aging demographics, um, a change or multiple changes actually to the definition of the sporadic CJD as well as improved diagnostics. Um, despite this uh, gradual increase, uh, we still believe that sporadic CJD and overall CJD is likely um, underreported. We're going to focus our time today mostly on the sporadic CJD. The onset is in um, middle age to early, 
early uh, late life uh, with a median age of 67 and mean age of 64. Survival can be about a year with a mean survival of about six months, although um, the survival post-diagnosis is only about four months. There are a total of six clinical pathological subtypes with various different presentations. I've just listed them here. We're not going to go into details today. But what do we see when people actually have um, CJD or sporadic CJD? They're usually most, um, mostly noticed by the patients and their families first. Um, these, um, because the disease actually affects multiple areas of the brain, people usually have symptoms and signs that are kind of vague in the beginning and can mimic many other conditions, making the diagnosis really difficult. Some of the potential um, uh, differential may include stroke, uh, acute neuropathy, hyperparathyroidism, um, other types of dementias, um, psychiatric decompensation, and even movement disorders. And oftentimes, many people are about two thirds of the way through the disease course before the correct diagnosis is made. So, how did uh, how did my mom experience it? Well, for her, just to give you a little bit of a background, she was a very independent sixty nine year old, had history of Graves' disease, uh, with replacement a bit of hypertension and some C-spine um, stenosis, um, but generally could walk several miles a day, manage everything in the household, include all of the finances. She loved traveling and would travel, arrange travel for herself every few months prior to the pandemic. And in March of last year, she started to just not feel like herself. She commented that she was aging quickly, was having more sleep trouble, and had horrible vertigo. And she described that feeling like she was just walking on a rocking boat. And uh, COVID um, was surging in Taiwan. She was getting really anxious about that. Um, and then she visited us um, in late May, early June. What um, happened for the next month and a half was just lots of fatigue, continued to have trouble with sleep and dizziness. And then she started complaining about some weakness in her legs and stiffness in her muscles, which were not too unusual for her. Um, and then she talked about needing to see an ophthalmologist for her blurry vision. Um, her appetite was not great and she thought that she was losing some weight. Um, and she also had supposedly really bad constipation. Generally speaking, she was just not feeling well and just had this feeling of bad thing was gonna happen. Um, by the end of her stay, um, she felt like she was just becoming a bit more forgetful. Uh, my dad observed after the fact that she was having trouble calculating and she was having questions about her thyroid medications that she had actually been taking for 20 years. By the time she got back to Taiwan, they required two weeks of quarantining a hotel uh, individually, not together, even in a family. Um, she was noted to be really disoriented of time and place, um, had an unwitnessed fall in her quarantine room. Uh, because of these issues, um, the health department allowed her to stay with my father. And uh, what was observed in the following 10 to 12 days was just um, a rapid decline in all um, not only was she not sleeping in the right time, was eating erratically. Um, there was some confabulation, thinking that my father was still working, even though he retired. Um, she was also talking about um, having objects that would change shapes and size. Um, and by the end of that 14-day quarantine, she lost her ability to use her smartphone. Um, didn't quite know how to write anymore, couldn't figure out how to dress herself or um, manage the shower. Um, this is a table that lists some of the first symptoms um, in sporadic CJD. 
um, that are often noticed by patients and their families. They spend multiple domains, cognitive domain, blur, constitutional, behavioral, motor, sensory, and visual. Aside from the cognitive, the most common ones are the cerebellar, constitutional, behavioral domains. Um, and Many of these, I'm pointing this out because many of these um, symptoms and signs noticed by patients and families are often what we consider to be common geriatric syndromes. Um, and you may also notice that the percentages don't add up to 100 because there could be a lot of overlaps um, among them. Um, the CDC actually uh, provides a diagnostic criteria for probable sporadic CJD definitive usually requires the tissues. Um, so it's a clinical diagnosis. And um, for the first part, a person either needs to have a neuropsychiatric disorder plus a positive uh, real-time quaking induced um, conversion where they kind of uh, amplify the uh, prions um, to make MOA fibril. And that actually has really good sensitivity up to the 90s um, from CSF or other tissues or a person presenting with rapid progressive dementia with at least two out of the four clinical features like myoclonos, uh, visual or cerebellar signs, pyramidal, experimental signs, or echinetic mutism uh, when the person sometimes can talk and sometimes can't. Um, and for part two, the person also needs to have a positive result on at least one of the following um, laboratory testing, a typical EEG during any part of the illness. And the EEG findings sometimes does not happen until in a more advanced state of CJD. And this may be periodic biphasic or triphasic sharp wave complexes. Um, or the person uh, may have a positive 1433 marker in the CSF um, when they have the condition uh, for less than two years. Or um, the MRI is actually very useful, um, especially when it's done with a DWI or flare sequence. Um, there is usually high signal in the calde putamen area uh, or in the cortical regions um, in the temporal parietal occipital region. And sometimes that's described as cortical ribboning. And then obviously also um, the person shouldn't have other potential um, reasons um, for other diagnosis before you can make a uh, probable sprout by CJD uh, diagnosis. So um, my, my mom actually had um, all of the positive test results and the clinical presentation. Um, the management is actually mostly supportive um, and palliative uh, in nature. And I have to say that this is when oftentimes um, geriatricians truly um, start to shine and partly because we are experts and bring everything together for the care of the uh, individual and their families. Um, so much of what we do on a regular basis uh, include uh, palliative care. And even when the patient's not always at the end of life, um, but obviously in her case, she was nearing the end of her life. So how do we train geriatricians and how do fellows nowadays become um, independent practicing geriatricians? Um, I want to spend a little bit of time to share with you some of the basics um, of the ACGME requirements. And ACGME is our accreditation body for graduate medical education training for both residency and uh, fellowship. And um, I will share with you too, also a little bit on how we design our program. 
starting with residence portion. Uh, both internal medicine residents and family medicine residents can apply to geriatrics. And um, geriatric is part of both residency trainings. They both require older adult population as exposures, although with different time durations. In internal medicine, four weeks total uh, as minimum. And then family medicine can be, you know, 100 hours a month or 125 patient encounters with long-term care experience over a minimum of two years. In internal medicine, there is no specification on where this experience needs to happen. Um, and it doesn't really talk about what needs to be included, um, other than that there should be a subspecialty education coordinator to help coordinate this learning experience for the internal medicine residents. On the other hand, um, in family medicine, um, they do um, specify sites, um, including a variety of care sites such as home, long-term care facilities, rehabilitation facilities, and the activities must include some functional assessments and management of patients with multimorbidity. So, Moving on to the fellowships level, um, the ACGME is much more specific about this uh, for obvious reasons. Um, it requires some um, setup for the curriculum organization, including 12 months of longitudinal clinical experience in the long-term care setting uh, where fellows have panels of patients and the fellows serve as the primary providers. The sites, um, there's not a lot of specification on the sites. However, the fellowship must include subacute care and rehabilitation um, as part of the training sites. And fellows also need to have exposures to daycare or day hospital centers, life care communities, or residential care facilities. And those may be assisted livings, board and cares. Um, with our fellowships, we're very fortunate to have our fellowship based out of the VA where fellows get to have a longitudinal uh, panel in the VA nursing home. And they also get to work with patients in the subacute setting in the San Francisco Center for Jewish Living. And our fellows also um, get to see patients um, and learn about the day-to-day um, in you know, day programs uh, through their unlock experience and also um, caring for patients at home or in residential care facilities during their house call rotation. Um, the ACGME also requires specific curricular activities, um, especially relating to home visits and hospice care. Fellows must have some experience in organizational and administrative aspect of home health care. Um, they must have experience in continuity care people who are living home or hospice or getting receiving hospice. Um, we have a zero psychiatry rotation set up, set up for the fellows um, and fellows get to also learn through simulation and in our fellowship they learn um, some of the uh, challenges that some of our older adults experience uh, along with other interprofessional learners um, as part of our curriculum. And um, fellows also need to be involved with other healthcare and community agencies um, that may be delivering healthcare in the community setting. And um, our fellows get to do some side visits during their Friday noon um, uh, didactic time. This is a sample of our four week block schedule. Um, there are 12 of them encompassing a wide variety of learning sites. And um, they also have three longitudinal panels where um, they get to take care of a variety of different patient populations uh, in San Francisco. The ACGME also have some specificity on the didactic curriculum, including various different types of conferences um, that are case-based, journal club, m and and quality improvement conferences so people can learn um, how to improve themselves and improve the systems, patient safety conferences. The content must include um, geriatrics 
topics um, as well as available community resources. And we also have a focus on uh, practice management. And the highlighted areas include um, our core curriculum. Uh, besides the core geriatric topics, our fellowship also include uh, a series on resilience, leadership skills, uh, quality improvements, and teaching skills. The fellows get to meet and interact with fellows from other geriatric fellowship programs in these West Coast most difficult case conferences. Um, they also get to work and interact with um, other professional learners on the Friday noon longitudinal interprofessional conference. Um, some of the learners may include law students, social work, um, nurses or nurse practitioners, um, and sometimes pharmacists. Fellows also get to work with or interact with research fellows in journal club, and they get to participate our Grand Rounds half day um, and meet with our visiting professors. This is a sample weekly curriculum. You can see that it's pretty packed. Um, they have lots of um, didactic conference times um, denoted in blue, and then the green um, colors uh, blocks are when they get to spend time to take care of their longitudinal patient panels. And um, they have about three uh, days to really rotate through the various different sites to your population. We use the AGS and the ADGAP um, geriatric curriculum milestones to help us uh, set up our curriculum. Um, there are a few domains that we always focus on, including caring for older adults, uh, system-based care, as well as geriatric syndromes. And these domains are further divided into subdomains. Um, when we design our interprofessional uh, longitudinal curriculum, uh, we ensure that the topics presented also um, are matched with the core competencies required by the various different professions. So that way, other interprofessional learners will also get to learn um, the core geriatric topics. And these um, geriatric curricular milestones help us ensure that we meet the ACGME requirements for our fellows. Um, with with the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship, uh, we assess our fellows based on their competency in um, these domains, uh, including patient care, medical knowledge, practice-based learning improvement, interpersonal and communication skills, system-based practice, and professionalism. These um, core competencies are further divided into sub-competencies, uh, and there are 23 of them. We actually review our rotations uh, regularly to make sure that each block has matched sub competencies for learner assessment purpose. And um, here is actually an example of what a competency and sub competency milestone look like by the levels. Um, you can see that there are uh, various different levels from one to five, one being novice and five being the experts. Um, we have a goal that our graduating fellows will reach a level four, um, although ACGME actually does not require that to be a graduation requirement. Um, this is really, as milestones uh, sets are really there to help us see how to support our fellows in progressing uh, through their learning, um, at least during the one year clinical fellowship. And then certainly for many of us practicing geriatrics already, we are still, many of us are still striving to achieve level five. And we assess the fellows um, by their progress uh, about twice a year. And our clinical competency committee help us um, to review the evaluations submitted by the faculty who work with the fellows. And I also meet with the fellows at least twice a year to discuss what they've done well and um, opportunities for further growth. And we submit individual fellows uh, milestones to the ACGME twice a year. The AGS and ADGAP also developed this geriatrics and trustable professional activities. And 
this is really a list um, that shows some of the observable and measurable tasks and responsibilities that geriatricians um, can be expected to do uh, by the end of their one year clinical fellowship training. Um, you can see that uh, geriatricians need to be able to provide very uh, comprehensive care to people with very complex conditions, um, be able to uh, carry out skill communications with patients, their colleagues, both in healthcare, as well as outside of healthcare, like the family members and the loved ones who are also supporting the patients. Um, and um, geriatrics is really about individualized medicine. Um, you'll also see that we do expect that geriatricians can teach principal geriatrics care to other health professions um, and patients and their family members, um, just because there will never be enough of us around. And so it's best to share our knowledge um, and experience uh, to all of those who are coming to contact and interacting with older adults in the community. And ultimately, I think some of the things that we do really well as geriatricians is also the ability to um, promote and advocate for system-based changes to ensure patient safety and improve the um, outcomes of our older adults. So I've said a lot, going back to the story um, of my mom. So I really tried very hard to not be her geriatrician, um, but I think it was inevitable that I did become her <laughs> geriatrician. Um, I ensured that she received person-centered care all the way through the end. Um, focusing on her comfort, she actually told me what she wanted at the end of her life. She's always someone very who's, um, who is very independent, uh, loved to travel, hidden at home, and uh, many years ago, she actually also told me that um, if she knows that she was going to die, she doesn't really want a memorial service because she won't be able to enjoy it <laughs> if she's dead. Uh, she'd rather celebrate it with her friends and family um, before her death. Um, and so knowing her general goals and values and prognosis uh, with her diagnosis, there was really no doubt that the next approach is focusing on her comfort um, with palliative care. And the question is what was available um, in Taiwan was something I was less familiar with. Um, so I, when I was quarantined in the quarantine hotel for two weeks, um, I reached out to different people and navigated through the Taiwanese healthcare system and actually guided my dad in connecting with a palliative care doctor in Taiwan to learn about the options for my mom, um, knowing, knowing her preferences. We had family meeting on the phone. We learned that um, with the pandemic, um, the inpatient hospice really had very limited visitation uh, for families and friends. Um, you can't have more than one visitor for more than two hours. And um, home hospice would be very challenging as well because the, this, the home hospice nurse wouldn't really get to see the patient for more than twice a month. And I was expecting that she was going to have a lot more symptoms. So either options would not work. And the palliative care doctor said that they also actually require assessment of the patient serially um, over time. And with my mom's condition, she really didn't have time. Um, she was declining by the days, if not by the hours. Um, so me and my dad actually decided to do something a little different. Um, after assessing what was possible to be done at home and not possible to be done at home. We ended up um, getting her into a local nursing home that was very close to um, home and so that he could get her out of the nursing home every day uh, for the afternoon so her family and friends could visit her at home and they could sit in the living room, look out the window and see this beautiful view outside of their window. Um, and to chat and snack 
and do whatever um, she wanted to do. Um, and um, after after the talk to my dad about the mindful of all the social stimulations that she was experiencing since um, her endurance um, was changing and we adjusted her schedule accordingly. Uh, we talked about what to expect as, um, uh, yeah, we talked about what to expect um, because people with dementia often will suffer from many complications related to dementia, um, such as, you know, aspiration, um, pressure injuries, um, and especially in CJD, actually seizures. Uh, and I, also work pretty closely with the caregivers and the psychiatrists um, to um, avoid <laughs> getting her on an antipsychotics um, because the caregiver was very battered by her persecutory delusions. Um, her symptoms only lasted three days, so it wasn't really worth it. Um, and then by the time I got to see her, she was truly really losing her speech and uh, mobility. Um, and we started to notice seizures. So we work with the neurologist on adjusting her seizure medications and find a uh, formulation that she could actually use. Um, I work with a the physical therapist and the occupational therapist to make sure she got the equipment that she needed. Um, and uh, she went through a, um, a four wheel walker, um, a standard wheelchair, and a custom made um, high back reclining wheelchair with neck support all within a matter of two weeks. Um, so this just kind of demonstrates again uh, how rapid um, sporadic CJD can be. Um, and when it became too much for her to travel, uh, we just had her stay in a nursing home and would bring her out to the patio so her friends and family could see her. She loved flowers and so we would cut flowers for her and bring them to the room so she could smell them. Uh, we hired her 24 seven caregiver and I became one of her caregivers as well and spent half a day with her. Um, I learned all about from the caregiver how to really um, take care of people um, on a very personal and intimate way to ensure comfort, especially with transfer, training, changing. And I also taught um, the caregivers and the nurses there on what to look out for with her decline. And uh, it was a really interesting exchange of knowledge and um, cultural beliefs, and um, certainly the geriatrics that I'm very familiar with. Um, they were very surprised um, to hear that we had requested to stop checking vitals, um, that we didn't want her to go to the hospital, and that we didn't want her to have um, two feedings, um, most, mostly because these are the things that she had wanted for herself. Um, but it was really interesting to see people's um, reaction when we requested these things for her. So where, where does this go? Um, and I think here is where I am by no man an expert or a scholar and um, in the area of well-being. And I definitely do not exemplify someone who's managed to figure out and maintain well-being. Um, I'm just an individual who's gone through a little bit of a roller coaster ride last year. Uh, many of us have at some point in our lives. Um, and I just want to share my experience with you, how this ties to the training of geriatricians and some of the strategies that work for me um, and some thoughts on the systems themselves. And I look up. Um, the definitions are actually very vague. It generally pertains to their feeling of being comfortable, healthy, happy, and content. Um, and really, intrinsically, it's what's valuable um, to an individual is what that individual may define as well-being for him or her or them. Um, it's, it, this is an incredibly important topic. Um, 
on a personal front and also in our day-to-day -day work, especially uh, during this time when many of us have gone through so many different changes and experienced so many different um, things in the last couple of years. Um, well-being is actually one of the sub-competencies um, for our geriatrics fellowship training. Um, it's, it falls under professionalism. And we hope that our fellows can really gain at least a fundamental knowledge on um, the factors that affect well-being, the mechanisms um, by which those factors affect well-being, and also the available resources and tools that one can use to improve well-being. And certainly, I think, at least for me, um, I am still learning a lot um, about this. And for me, last year was definitely marked by grief, um, not only because of the pandemic itself, um, the violence, but also that I've lost my best friend uh, and my mentor, the person who actually encouraged me to go into geriatrics. Um, and I was grieving even before the diagnosis uh, was made. And um, I'm just gonna spend a few minutes um, to describe some strategies that work for other people and also certainly work for me. Um, and I think for me personally, gaining self-awareness was what really helped me through some of the roughest time, recognizing my own distress um, in the middle of all of this. Um, prior to her diagnosis, um, when there was a lot of uncertainty and the distress, um, that I experienced at the time of diagnosis. Um, I think recognizing this distress and the causes really helped me to focus on what was important and what still is very important to me. Um, and it's not really that different from when we have serious illness conversations with our patients and their family members, except this is mostly internal. Um, there's a pause that one may take and one may have in some internal dialogues um, to kind of process all of this. Um, and recognizing uh, my own emotional reactions, my own biases, and how my previous past experiences um, certainly have influenced my experience um, with grief and the actions and the reactions that I had. Um, and there are many things that have been uh, mentioned in the literature. Um, for some, uh, it's naming the emotion um, and making it very obvious because when people are going through distress, there is usually a, a mess of emotions. Um, keeping a journal, writing down how one feels physically and emotionally in the moment can be helpful to some people. Acknowledging the uncertainties, uh, recognizing that many things in life are actually outside of our own control, and setting time to practice mindfulness, being free from distraction and judgments. And some techniques may include breathing exercises or guided imagery. And personally, I found very what was very helpful was uh, getting different perspectives from people and getting feedback uh, from people because those may actually um, help uh, to reframe the situation. Um, I am personally not a religious person, and I grew up uh, with family members in all religions. This is something I've learned from Buddhism, where um, you know, suffering is kind of the result of pain and resistance. It's kind of intuitive. Um, and living, being alive, and being human will inevitably bring us some pain. Um, and this 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 is an emotional piece of the pain, but a lot of it is also how we um, personally choose to respond. And the more we resist, the more we may suffer. And I um, found this to be a really nice reminder and uh, helps me to kind of recenter myself when I think of this. Um, reframing pain is really hard, especially when someone is in the middle of it. And resisting that 
um, unpleasantness is sometimes the most common and the first reaction that people have. Uh, but when we take a different path, it may change the degree of suffering that we experience in life. Um, and this really gets at the idea of self-regulation. Um, while there's, there's definitely no right or wrong on how we respond to situations, um, but there are always consequences and what worked for one person may not work for other people. Um, I have in the last six or nine months um, been trying to live in the present moment. Um, this quote was actually from my mom. Um, that was the last thing that she said to me. Um, after that, she actually really stopped talking uh, and couldn't talk anymore. Um, it was really hard for me to watch her turn from a very vibrant person to someone who became completely dependent on all aspects of living. Um, and her statement here was really meaningful to me because in her situation, there's really no future. Um, and she was, I think, I don't know, but I think she was trying to remind me that, you know, we only have the moment that we have and just these moments are very fleeting and once they're gone, they'll never come back again. So I could choose to be upset and um, be sad about every moment, or I could just accept the situation as it is and try to make the most out of it. Um, and I think, I think this is also when I realized that there was very little that I have control over in my life, um, but I do have the ability to choose how to respond and how to prioritize uh, based on what's important to me. Um, and I think this is when self-compassion become, becomes really important and giving uh, myself the permission to um, take time and to receive um, the kindness that I can give to myself, um, the kindness that I give to other people that I have come into contact with. So what worked? What worked for me? Um, I took a lot of pauses and took a lot of deep breath. Um, and so that. <laughs> Standing values and prioritizing what's important uh, take the initiative to actually address the situation instead of waiting, um, because sometimes waiting isn't going to change the situation, but rather taking the initiative um, as my response. Uh, being transparent, I thought was extremely useful for me. Um, letting folks know, people in my work, people in my personal life know what was going on because certainly I was appearing not like I was acting like my usual self. Um, I practice a lot of humility and expression of vulnerability. Um, and I thought that um, was liberating. Um, I had to be very hard on myself on setting boundaries on what I needed to get done um, for my family. And hearing, um, hearing other people's perspective, like from my mom's friends, from my dad's friends, from my own friends, um, I thought was really helpful for me to think about the situation a little bit differently. And when things were really bad, um, I just focused on the basics, uh, made sure that I slept, ate, and exercised regularly. And I, um, I'm not a physically very organized person um, in keeping my home very organized, but I, I love Marie Kondo's method of staying tidy, which is only keeping the things that bring joy. And so I will say, you know, I took that to heart and only um, did the things that brought joy to my life. And I'm still trying very hard to do that. Um, being in Taiwan uh, during this part of the journey um, really actually helped me to gain additional perspectives um, on the cultural and systems differences in which care is delivered um, to older adults and to people in general. Um, I also still remember 
um, the amazement, um, the wide-eyed expressions that my friends and families uh, in their eyes. Um, wh when I was in Taiwan, that they heard our institution actually allowed colleagues to donate vacation times um, to support each other when someone um, have to take an unexpected leave. Um, and that is just completely unheard of. And what they kept saying was, oh my God, your colleagues are just amazing human beings. Um, this would never happen in Taiwan. Um, and I have to say like things like these, these additional perspective really just helped me um, to practice more gratitude. Um, and sometimes I really wish I know who all of those people are um, so I could go to them and individually thank them. Um, and I think at this point, I just have to thank everyone in UCSF because I don't really know how the system works in the back end. And this harps on the importance and of having a community and village. Um, certainly there's a informal village and community that each of us all have. Uh, we have families, we have friends. Um, sometimes we have support groups um, where people get to share similar experiences, um, even though situations may be different. And certainly there are also uh, professional support through coaching, counseling, and therapy. Um, so beyond oneself, I've done a lot of reflecting here with you. Beyond ourselves, um, there are also institutional and societal level of changes that actually need to occur to foster well-being of um, each, each individual. Actually, uh, in the public's interest and the healthcare institution's interest to support every member's journey to well-being. Um, people who have capacity to take care of themselves are better able to care for others and make less errors, are less likely to leave. Um, and at the same time, it's, I think, also important to recognize that some of these bigger changes um, or structural changes uh, will probably lag uh, behind the demands. Um, different societies also have their own norms, own expectations, um, and those um, can take even longer uh, to change. So as I reflect on my own journey to become a geriatrician, I'm just grateful for the education that I've received to prepare myself for one of the most difficult times in my own life. Uh, as geriatricians, I think, We've been really well equipped with the knowledge and skills to manage geriatric syndromes, guide patients and loved ones through um, the different phases of their